All right, we are on the second part of Unit 2, Evidence. So yes, we are still in forensic science. I always have to bring that to your attention, that you don't forget what class you're in, right? So we are going to talk about a little bit more on evidence, but kind of in a different way. Um, this might interest you guys, and I'm kind of like worried about that. But this next little bit that I'm going to talk about, I don't have a lot of pictures to show you because it's on death and decomposition. And as I was looking at pictures, because you guys know that I don't mind, like, kind of grossing you out, they were kind of grossing me out. Like, yeah. So, um, I don't have a ton of pictures to show you, nor did I find any good videos that were appropriate. Holy cow, there's some scary stuff out there. But, death and decomposition is a big part of evidence because when different people start to examine that body, they can determine a lot of things about the body that can help them um, you know, figure out, figuring out what time um, this person died, how, um, all that stuff. So I'm going to go into some major details, some that you might be like, holy cow, this is disgusting. But um, please make sure you read your little lesson along with this because there's some good details in there as well. All right, so here's a little picture of a death scene, right? Okay, but I want you guys to know death is a process. It's not an event. Sometimes people are like, yep, dead, done. All right, that's it. Take it away. No. Um, death is a process. And the reason why I say that is because you're going to see that as we talk about all these different things that happen, yes, the actual time of death when um, blood flow stopped and brain activity ceases, that is death. But death, there's a process after it that can um, you know, help people determine the time of death. Because obviously if someone wasn't exactly there at that time, then you have to kind of figure those things out, okay? So, um, the declaration. And I like to um, talk about the declaration because basically, say someone arrives on scene, paramedics, fire department, police, okay? They can determine that someone's dead, they can check for pulse, they can do stuff like that, and they can determine. But they can't necessarily declare death, okay? The people that declare death are, are ultimately people that are trained in that. And I'll get into that in one second. But once death is confirmed, the time, date, place are noted, okay, as well as the name and affiliation of the person making that determination. So again, paramedics, police, um, fire department, they can determine that someone is dead, but they cannot declare it, okay? So that doesn't go on their death certificate. It's not until people like keys. So we talk about the who. So who determines death, okay? People such as coroners, okay, medical examiners, and their assistants, okay? Coroners and medical examiners, and I've talked about them in the past, that um, a lot of times they have specific training, um, sometimes they're masters or even their doctor, okay, where medical examiners can be doctors. Not all of them are, but a lot of them are. Sometimes coroners are medical examiners, so sometimes this is one and the same. But also their assistants, which we'll talk about in just a moment. So those are the people that actually declare death, okay? They will come to the crime scene, and they will declare the death, and then they will start to figure out the possible whys and hows and whens, okay? So here is an example of um, a medical examiner. Okay, this isn't necessarily at a crime scene, so medical examiners can be in different places. Um, sometimes, you know, if someone dies of natural causes in a, in a house or whatever, you still, the body would be transported and a medical examiner would sometimes either perform the autopsy or do other types of things to figure out. Um, again, another medical examiner. The coroners typically, um, again, they can be medical examiners, so this could be a coroner slash medical examiner, um, but you'll always see typically the coroners that um, are at the crime scene, okay? But a forensic examiner, okay? Sometimes a forensic examiner does not have all of the training schooling that um, maybe a medical examiner has or a coroner, okay? But a forensic, forensic examiner does a lot of important things as well. When you think about it, photographing the body is one possible thing. Now, not always does the forensic examiner do that, but there are a lot of um, forensic examiners that kind of basically do a lot of different duties. So one would be photographing the body, okay? So something like this, okay? Um, now, this is kind of looks like a made-up scene, but nonetheless, this forensic examiner would be photographing not only the body if it still was here, but also the evidence, okay? And then also they might collect evidence from the body. So maybe after the body is removed, 
they might start collecting evidence around where that body was in order to find more that kind of supports maybe the um, determination of death, okay? And another thing is they make notes about the condition of the body and the surroundings, so they're going to take extensive notes, okay? They're going to notice everything about this body. I mean, they are examining this body, okay? Forensic examiner and medical examiner are absolutely in there examining every little inch of that body, trying to figure out some different things, okay? And the last thing is they're going to try to identify the victim, okay? There's various ways, and we'll get into that in some of the later things, you know, where they can look at teeth, they can look at DNA, um, a whole bunch of different things. Um, so obviously they'll check for the, you know, the, the easy stuff like a wallet, hello, but um, if that doesn't exist there, they will do other things to try and identify the victim because that's the first thing that, you know, they want to try and figure out who is this, okay? So let's talk about the body and its changes. Now, again, I don't have a ton of pictures. I don't want, this is not my intention to gross you out or to, you know, you know be this gory class, but you have to understand that all of this is still biology, okay? When we talk about what happens with the body, um, and we're going to get into the decaying part of that as well. That's biology, okay? The study of life, and then obviously when life ends, things, is, things are still happening, okay? So we're going to just focus on the first 48 hours, and then the next bit that I go into is kind of days and days and days later, okay? But the first 48 hours after death, we call that postmortem, okay? I know you guys have all heard that term before. But we will use that a lot when you hear when we talk about you know forensic science and so forth because postmortem that is a big period of time where they can figure out more accurate times of, of death. Okay, so I'm going to go through kind of each of these briefly and tell you a little bit about why some of these might happen. But the first thing that's going to happen right after death, pretty much, is the skin is going to start to turn purple. And I shouldn't say right after. I would say anywhere from like an hour to two hours you'll start seeing the skin turning purple in the lowest parts of the body. Now you may not see that until the body's turned over, okay? So an example of this is um, this picture right here is basically a picture of somebody who was laying on their stomach because the purpleness is basically on the bottom side of them. Now any place there's a point of contact with the ground is not going to pool blood. And see what's happening in this liver mortis is basically over time, when the body is not functioning, obviously, as a live entity, it, the hemoglobin in blood, which is what binds to the oxygen, it starts to break down, okay? And basically, um, everything in your body will start to break down over time, but blood will start to kind of go out of the circulatory system and pool in the areas surrounding it. And obviously, because of gravity, if you're laying face down, it's going to be on the bottom side of you. So you're going to start to see that skin turning purple. And then within eight hours, um, typically that is not necessarily permanent. You could actually push on the skin and see the changing of color. But after eight hours, if you push on that skin, that color is permanent. Okay, It's not going to go away. Not that it's not like you need that to, but that's, again, another indication of how long ago has this body, you know, did this, was this um, body found dead. Okay, So that those they use those time periods to really figure out um, some of the exact times of death, okay? The next thing is rigor mortis. So rigor mortis is, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard of that, it's the stiffening of muscles, okay? So basically, um, you can also see the pooling of blood here, just like we talked about the liver mortis. Um, and that, the um, rigor mortis is basically due, and I'm sure you guys might remember these terms, but ATP is basically the... Um, the component in our, all of our cells, it's like this big energy um, molecule, okay? That's where we get all of our energy in our cells to do what they do, and basically we get that, um, you know, I don't want to go into that in depth, but if you guys remember from biology, cellular respiration, yeah, that's where we form ATP, a lot of it. Well, ATP obviously is being ceased to be made, but there's that last bit of it still there, kind of causing these muscles to contract and um, they will stiffen up, but then obviously over time, everything's starting to be broken down, and so those muscles really begin to relax after a while, okay? But that is what rigor mortis is. And then the last one is algal mortis, which I don't necessarily have any pictures of, but algal mortis is just a body temperature that is going to approach ambient temperature, okay? So basically, it's going to um, kind of become the temperature it is of the surroundings, 
So if um, someone were you know, to die in a freezer, obviously, um, algor mortis is where their body temperature will drop, drop, drop to where, whatever their surroundings is. Um, but also it depends on many different things. You know, it depends on how humid it is, if that person is clothed or not. Um, different factors can affect how quickly the body temperature drops to its surrounding, okay? So there's a little bit about postmortem. So that's the first 48 hours. You'll, you'll read more about this um, in your little quick lesson and it shows you pictures and it gives you good time frames. So make sure you guys go over that, okay? Now, just some other stuff that happens, and I'm not gonna go over the digestion too heavily when we talk about the stomach, because um, we will do that in a lab coming up. But the eyes, that's another thing, is that a medical examiner or a coroner will actually look at the person's eyes, whether they're open or closed. If they're open, they're gonna be very dry, and changes are gonna happen very quickly because there's no tears, nothing that, that is lubricating the eye. So within a couple hours even, you'll start to see kind of a foggy, almost like if you have anybody in your family that's had a cataract, like a grandma or a grandpa, typically when you get older, it's that kind of fogginess on your eye. And that typically happens anywhere from two hours-ish if their eyes are open, or if the person's eyes are closed, it may take up to eight hours or so to see that fogginess. Um, also, potassium starts to accumulate in the vitreous humor, which is that goopy, goopy eye fluid that actually keeps your eyeball kind of um, in a hard, hard state. But basically, it's going to be very kind of a, a foggy, this film over the eyes. And again, um, depending on whether or not the eyes are open or closed, you can kind of determine um, possible you know, times of death with that. And then a lot of times people look at stomachs and they see what's in the stomach and they look, they think about the digestive process. And again, and I'm going to back this up a little bit so it's a little blurry, but um, when we talk about digestion, again, we're only concerned about trying to figure out maybe the last time they ate um, and possibly then um, put that together with the possible time of death. So basically when we talk about the digestive system, you know, it takes a certain amount of time for food, basically, once it's entered the stomach, because if you eat, obviously that food's gonna enter the stomach pretty quickly, but it takes a couple of hours for it to actually leave the stomach. And then another, you know, I believe four hours, and I could be wrong, because I'm, I'm not sure what your text says, but that's how I've always taught, is about four to six hours still in the um, small, small intestine, and sometimes even longer. So depending on what they find in the stomach and the small intestine, and even the large intestine, as far as waste is concerned, that can also tell them the last time they ate and try to start to reconstruct that crime scene based on maybe some other evidence. So not always does the, di di the digestive system play a part, but a lot of times it does too, okay? So we'll talk about more of that when we do our lab together. All right, now the last thing is decay. And again, I don't, I'm not gonna show you guys a bunch of gross, gory pictures because believe me, there are some on the online, but I thought that's not really the point of this. It's just learning, right? If you guys go into forensic science, you'll see this, you'll, I promise. Um, so uh, you can go and search your own pictures if you want, but um, yeah, they're kind of crazy. So when we talk about decay, there are different stages. Now remember, the first 40 hour, 48 hours is just called postmortem. But now we're talking about decaying. So if the body has not been found, it's gonna undergo these different stages. So stage one, initial decay, basically between zero and three days, but pretty much basically post-mortem is, is also starting the decay process, but really from day two to three, you're gonna see a couple of specific things. Flies are gonna lay eggs, maggots are born, insects and bacteria begin to break down organs. So that's basically, typically around day two to day three. You'll start to see that happen if a body hasn't been recovered and then obviously taken in and done an autopsy and you know the embalming process and all that stuff. So without that, this is what will happen around day three. You'll already start to see maggots. Um, kind of a gross thought, but that's part of the decaying process. So let's go into a little bit more because now stage two, putrefaction. Okay, day, that's day four to 10 days. Okay, so basically putrefaction, and, and you can think about the term that I'm saying, it's pretty kind of a gross term um, in itself. It's pretty gross what happens. I mean, and this is just what happens 
um, you know, in bodies when decay starts to happen. And this is just a picture of um, a pig, but basically the skin's going to start to turn greenish, okay? The maggots and bacteria will continue to break down cells, and we have this huge influx of maggots and, and different bacteria. So during this putrefaction, there's some nastiness that's happening. I mean, you would it kind of almost disfigured. Also, this is going to create gases within the different cavities and in the body. And so a lot of times you'll see bloating. So um, I believe in your unit it shows the kind of the different decaying processes with um, an animal. And you can see that bloating, okay? So it's kind of kind of crazy. It very much distorts um, what this thing was, okay? And then this is going to, um, obviously it's going to create gases that bloat the body. And those gases do leak and it does stink and it's going to attract more insects. Yum. Okay, stage three, black putrefaction. Holy cow, now, doesn't that just give you the, mm, I want to go eat some ham sandwiches and stuff. No, just kidding. Black putrefaction. Okay, so basically what's happening there, the gases are going to escape. So the body cavities are going to start to burst. Not, not necessarily like, poosh, but they're going to burst and you're going to have fluids that start to leak out. Now, mind you, while this is all happening, you still have insects and maggots and bacteria that are breaking down your flesh, and um, ultimately, you know, you start to have these gaping holes, okay? So, um, there's going to be some black kind of liquid, the or the skin, I'm sorry, the skin actually appears blackish, bluish, but then there'll be like liquid kind of all around. Insects are going to eat the majority of the flesh left, okay? So, this is probably the grossest part, but again, um, it's kind of how, you know, I, well, I won't go into any more about, about that, but ultimately that's, um, that's one of the grossest parts of the decaying process. Stage four, um, butyric fermentation. So remember, we're on day 20 to 50. So if a, if a body has not been retrieved, it's been 20 to 50 days. That's a long time, okay? Typically, bodies are found here in the initial decay, and then really four to 10 days um, is, is becoming kind of a long period of time. But, you know, may, what, who knows what would have happened, but maybe 20 to 50 days, you now find a body, okay? The flesh will be gone now. The body starts to dry out, okay? So once the flesh is gone, there's not a lot of moisture. There's nothing for maggots to feed on, so maggots are kind of gone, disappeared. But now you'll see beetles. So it's interesting that, you know, I remember one of my favorite movies in the entire world, good old um, Goonies, if you guys have seen the Goonies. Um, I just remember a particular part where they were trying to get this um, necklace off of the skull. It was actually Chester Copperpot, and they move the skull and beetles come out. Um, and it's funny because I think, hmm, okay, well that's determining that that person died 20 to 50 days prior to that ish, you know. But, um, and really they made it out to be like years and years had gone by. But ultimately, after the flesh is gone, there's still some things to feed on, okay? Typically, if you just have dry bones and nothing else, there's not much to feed on. You're not going to see insects around. But in this particular part um, of the decaying process, there's still some things to feed on. There's still some ligaments, possibly, um, and whatever else. So, so there are some bugs that will still be kind of feeding off of that. Okay, and the last thing is dry decay, so more than 50 days. So obviously, dry decay kind of tells you what you know what's there. Only bones and ligaments, if the ligaments are even remaining. Um, hair may still exist beyond, um, you know, just bones, but typically you'll have mites and other things that will start to feed off of the hair and the bones, so that will start to disappear as well. So basically, in dry decay, you're not looking at very much left other than bones. The ligaments will start to, you know, slowly disappear as far as, um, you know, the mites and the other animals that are starting to really gnaw on the bones and clean them off. So, anyways, there is your decay process. Kind of crazy. Um, but there's death and decomposition. So I wanted you guys to know, and this is, you know, a huge part of the evidence and what the medical examiners and the coroners use in order to try and determine, you know, times of death and possible um, reasons for death. Okay? So there's a little bit more about evidence. We'll be back to the next part.